Hello, hello, and welcome again on another Misadventure That Adventure journey. And I'm your host, Len Rosen. Misadventures come in many different flavors, from the oops variety all the way past oh my god and beyond. Misadventures can teach and inspire, and in many cases simply leave us awestruck. The one thing that we can all agree about having a misadventure is that if, God willing, we get through it, we definitely have a very unique story to tell. In today's episode, we bring you another live interview where our guest will share with all of us his misadventure in hopes that we can feel the same jaw-dropping experience that he had felt while living through it. On today's episode, we have an anonymous guest who goes by the name of John. And in his own words, when you hear his story, you'll understand why. And so, without any further ado, let's bring John onto the show to tell us about his unusual and unforgettable experience. John, welcome to Misadventure That Adventure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And we're looking forward to hearing about this very interesting story because I got a preview of it. But um, please go ahead. Uh, tell us about yourself first. Thank you for having me, Len. So No worries at all. So as you know, I'm using a, a pseudonym for this story uh, as John, for obvious reasons, as you'll soon hear. <laughs> yeah. And in... A bit about me, I'm 29, I live in Australia, and I work in the digital marketing space. And I'm currently living in Melbourne, where I absolutely love it. It's mm. it's, it's a city where I feel like I'm at home, and I'm, I've only ever experienced that once in my life, uh, which is Berlin. So I don't know if you've ever just been to a city and you just felt like you belonged. Absolutely, absolutely. Far more times than once. But I do want to reinforce... There's something that there's a question you asked me about what I have given up. It's like what, sorry, what I know now about travel and what I could have done in a nine to five job, would I have given up that for the work? And I would say, absolutely not. I would say these experiences and this story, while it's funny and dangerous at times, I wouldn't have traded for the world. It's, it's taught me so much about myself. Wonderful. And Wonderful. I wouldn't be as happy without these stories and these adventures. I really wouldn't be. It's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Absolutely. These are the adventures, or in this case, <laughs> misadventures, as everyone will, everyone's about to hear, of a lifetime. Yeah, it is. So, John, I got a preview of your story. Um, when you contacted us and I am so much looking forward to hearing the detailed version and sharing it with our audience. So please fire away. The story began while I was um, traveling around Asia. I did the typical student gap year thing where I left my master's and I thought now is the best time to go traveling on my own. And halfway through my year of travel, I somehow ended up in Vietnam and while I was going through Vietnam on my motorbike, I stumbled across this couple at a hostel. They were from California and we got on well. And how I got introduced to them was I was just sitting around a dinner table at a restaurant and I pulled out a joint and, and they, they could say, hey, hey, OK, <laughs> uh, very nonchalantly. Yeah, OK. And, <laughs> And then this couple beside me looked at me and said, oh, could we have some? 
And I said, sure. And then that's how we just got started talking. And it turns out that this couple owns a weed farm in California. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So after, after getting to know them that night and then over the next few weeks, they said, you're a pretty cool guy. Do you want to come and work on our farm in California if, if you want to? And I thought about it and I thought, no, nah, this actually seems a bit, I, in my head, I said, this all seems a bit too dodgy. Hmm. And I went traveling for another month or so. And then I was starting to run out of money. And then I was still in touch with them, obviously, over Facebook. And then I thought, look, what do I have to lose? I asked them, how much could I earn a day? And they told me it'd be between 150 to 200 like US a day, cash in hand. Mm -hmm. Not bad and, at all. <laughs> yeah, not bad. And then I would have all the food, all the drink, and all the weed I could, I could smoke at the same time. Well, <laughs> there's a lot there, but uh, anyway, go on. What happened? So then, so I was in Philip. I was in the Philippines when I, this was all coming coming together, and I actually can. So while I was planning this, I actually convinced a girl I met two days before she was from Spain to come with me. So me and this Spanish girl went on a plane all the way to California and oh my gosh <laughs> we began a new life in what was a shed we actually so when we got onto the farm they picked us up in San Francisco and then we went all up to Sacramento to a place called Grass Valley and it was named Grass Valley before weed it's just happy coincidence I was just going to say that. appropriate name for the <laughs> anyway sorry sorry so yeah, we got there and I was in a state of culture shock because it was, I don't know if you've ever been to California, but oh, it God, is yeah. really, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was as if I was put back into the sixties. I saw hippies everywhere. Yes. Everyone was like peace, love and weed was everywhere. I tried putting out a cigarette and I was shocked because I couldn't, it was illegal for me to smoke a cigarette on the street, but it was totally fine to have a joint. <laughs> yeah, well, just... like what a contradiction <laughs> there. I mean, like, no, but I mean, LA, especially in California is one of those places where you feel like you're in a time warp. Like uh, it's, you see some of those signs, like they, they look like they come right out of the sixties, like on the restaurants and that's like burgers, fries, shakes, <laughs> and they've got these diamond shapes and <laughs> jaggedy edged fonts, you know, and it's like, it's really yeah. cool. I mean, it's beautiful. It's just, it's like this, this time warp because you see all these in photographs from back in the day, but now they're like right here, live in front of your face. So it, it's really an interesting sight to see, but yeah, but, but go on. So we get onto the farm and obviously we're just tired from the trip. So they show us to where we're going to sleep and it was a shed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in this shed, we had, there was two double bunks. So we had a double mattress each, so it was actually like a luxurious shed. <laughs> I'm sorry, what kind of shed? A luxurious shed. Oh, oh, luxurious shed. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, let's talk about like a, I didn't know those <laughs> words could go together. Like talk about an oxymoron. Luxurious shed. <laughs> I mean, you know, like a, here's our suite. Yeah. You can have our, this, this is our shed, our best shed. You get the best shed in the house. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. It could Sorry, be in a form on, of on. glamping almost, like a very posh shed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> so they put us to work the next morning. We had to get up each day at 8 a.m. And we typically worked until 8 p.m. With, with a half an hour break in between. So what our job was, oh, so to give you the lay of the land. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there were several different jobs on this marijuana farm. There was... The main job, obviously, was when everything was ripe, uh, you would take it from the field, you would cut it up into single strips and leave it on, let's say, like chicken wire or coat hangers to dry out for several weeks. Then once that is, once that is ready to go, you put those into like giant bins that will be taken to a sorting room. And in the sorting room, it's up, people are, are scattered around tables with scissors and they cut them up into essentially the finished product, which is what you would get in a weed bag. Right, right. Very different and, from life on the vineyards. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, go on, go on. 
so my job because i didn't obviously know how to oh the last stage is called pruning so that's when you have the scissors i didn't understand how to do that and that's more complicated Mm -hmm. so my job was simply hang everything up and put it back down once it's red once it's dry and bring it to all the pruners so i was doing that for maybe one two weeks and but in in that time again lay of the land i was the only english-speaking person on this farm really so (laughs) so when i arrived it was Myself, Spanish girl, uh, a couple from Mexico, five, six guys from Argentina, some people from Chile, Chile, and a guy from Ecuador. So Okay, now you said you were the only English-speaking person, so how did you guys uh, communicate? Some of them spoke broken English, and our boss, who was from uh, Honduras, spoke perfect English. But apart from that, it was lots of charades, pointing, I asked, what is this? What is that? And then I eventually learned some Spanish, mostly swear words. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I that's what I picked up. And I quickly learned what a gringo is because sometimes they would call, they would call refer to me as the gringo, and I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was everyone on the farm. And then I'm trying to think, what? Oh yeah, so on the first night, obviously I'm asking, like, here's the white boy asking all the silly questions. Like, um, what kind of weed are we making? Like, is it legal? Is it not legal? And eventually I was told to shut up asking questions because oh. I thought everything was legal. Okay. <laughs> but, Red flags beginning to yeah. raise. Because <laughs> they, they were like, why are you asking so many questions? And I was like, oh, I'm just interested. It's like, is this going to like a pharmacy? And they said, no, like this is 100% illegal. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm asking, so like, how do you get your stuff to Ireland? Because they told me they actually shipped their wheat to Ireland. And here's the funny thing. You know, those giant uh, like rock rock band tour buses that you see yeah, yeah. going across America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that's they're filled with weed oh. and, they, and they have people in the truck pretending to be a band. Ladies and gentlemen, the weed band performing at a... That's <laughs> all right. Oh, man. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, so how many of those buses they got going up and down there? <laughs> they said they have about four at a time. No, oh, well, four at a time. Like, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, four at a time. So it's a pretty, pretty steady operation. You think? And I asked them, I said, <laughs> how come all the weed in Ireland we get? Why does it all smell like cheese? And that's when they laughed and they said, actually, that we, you know, those giant circles of cheese? Yeah, 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 yeah. They hollow them out and they put the weed in that oh, because it covers up the smell. Sakes. <laughs> Cheesy <laughs> weed! <laughs> well, I guess that solves the craving for the cheese, uh, <laughs> for the cheese snacks when you, <laughs> you kind of like a two in one go there. All right. Okay. Anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> So once I figured out that it was all illegal, I did stop asking questions because they didn't obviously want to rock the boat because they they thought like, okay, white boy came out of the farm. He might, I don't know, could be undercover. But thankfully I wasn't. Yeah, you think. (laughs) (laughs) So let me ask you, as time went by and you were asking all these questions, naturally I assume they're going to be getting nervous or whatever. Like, did their demeanor change around you? Like... uh, after they were you asked getting... all these questions, did they like, uh, you know, like be like, eh, we better be careful of this guy. Uh, we better not say much or talk as little as possible to him. Or like, what was their reaction over time that way toward you? They, they were a bit suspicious for, say, a week until they obviously, they told me that they spoke to the people I met in Vietnam. And they said, well, but essentially you're vetting him and if anything if he goes wrong it's essentially on you Mm, 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 because they trusted me to come to the farm so anything i did was on them right right and they said no no john is fine you have nothing to worry about he's sweet like he knows nothing he's he's really innocent he actually knows nothing and like before i even went onto the farm i've never even seen weed Yeah, well, you know what they say, a first time for, you know. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just mesmerized by all this. Like, I mean, what an experience. I mean, I, I hope there's a part two, like there's a conclusion to this or a part two or whatever. Please go on. 
oh there's plenty more so like in the first on the first week of the farm obviously i'm still asking all these questions and again i'm asking like oh is there like bears around is there tigers or snakes and that day where i asked about a snake there was a rattlesnake in our kitchen oh lovely <laughs> so but one of the lads from argentina him being this macho man from Lat- from latin america and also a chef says don't worry don't worry I don't know why I'm putting on a Russian accent. But anyway. <laughs> I was about to say, a new guest has arrived. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, don't worry. And he brings out a chainsaw. A chainsaw. And I'm not joking. He goes into the kitchen. He says, everyone to go. And he puts on the chainsaw and he cuts the ch- snake in half. And then he skins it and we have snake for dinner. With a chainsaw. Isn't that a little overkill? I mean, hasn't anyone it, heard of a knife? We just didn't want to... <laughs> Simple knife will do. Did he, did he slice this meat or did he saute it? <laughs> well, he cut the head off with the chainsaw. He just wanted to make sure that he got it once. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm sure he got it. <laughs> got it good. <laughs> so then obviously a few weeks went by. I'm... We're all getting used to our life. We're, we're now starting to save up a bit of money. Once we started having enough um, money, we started planning, let's, let's say, day trips around San Francisco or L.A. So after off, when we finished all our touristy things, we obviously had to go back onto the farm. But this time we had to switch farms. So the first farm I was on was essentially in the middle of a desert. And then this farm that we went on to was up in the hills, so it's much higher, much more dense, and much fewer plants. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and this one was much more difficult because we actually had to deal with bears constantly. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Another challenge for John. <laughs> oh, but we quickly got, quickly got acquainted with the bears. When you got acquainted with the bears, would you invite them out for tea or something? Like what? <laughs> Because I don't know if you've seen what a bear bin is. Mm. It's a, it's like a giant trash can, like a typical American black trash can. But on the top has special pulleys on the side and a vent on top so that a bear can't open it and smell can't go out. Mm. And this way you can put all your food in it and a bear won't know. And even if they know, they won't be able to get in it. So the only thing that we had to be conscious of or aware of is you do not leave any food or alcohol or any water in your tent. Absolutely no, because a bear will come and get it. And I didn't realize how serious this was until... Oh, one... I see what's coming. Okay, go oh, ahead. Oh, you know what's happening, yeah. <laughs> so one guy, we were, out on, we were out at a club one night like in the city, and when we came back, a guy unfortunately left a sandwich in his tent and his tent was scattered across the campgrounds bits and pieces everywhere oh my gosh and thank thank god he wasn't there at the time like we were so lucky in one sense and then he was obviously terrified and the owner said don't worry you can stay in our camper van until you get a new tent because he was just shaking naturally (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the next but the next morning I'm sitting down having breakfast outside my tent and I'll actually send my you this goodness. video you can if you can attach it to this but I actually recorded the baby bear walking up to our campground wow. I'm looking at it it's looking at me and then it looks at a pizza box <laughs> what's more so delicious to me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the baby cub runs over to the pizza box, picks it up, looks back at me, and then jolts for the forest, never to be seen again. It took the whole pizza box. It took the pizza box, and I have a video of it running away with the pizza. If you could send us that clip, I'll, I'll sh- I can show that clip on our YouTube channel version. Yeah, if you can send that clip, uh, that would be great. <laughs> there's a bear, there's a bear, John, like, no one believes you, like, there's nothing going on, like, you're grand, you're grand. And then eventually I run around to the side of the camp and then I see the bear going through the fields of weed and then starting to eat some of the weed. (laughs) But it's supposed to be the other way around, (laughs) like take the weed, then the pizza. (laughs) (laughs) This bear's got it the reversed way. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, the, the, well, I obviously had um, different bare necessities. I was like, oh, terrible, Vaughn, terrible. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. We'll leave that in. You don't have to worry. I do that more often than you do anyway, so. <laughs> um. So all of, about 20 of us are just now watching this bear and trying to get it to go. But at the same time, my boss is reminding me, this is the cub. Where is the mom? Because that's the one we need to actually be afraid of. Right. You know? Yes. Because yeah. <laughs> a bear cub is basically the size of like a, just a large Labrador kind of thing. Mm. Whereas the mama, mama bear could be the size of a car. <laughs> She's going to come back would... and say, where the hell is my pizza? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so after, after all that, I'm trying to think, oh, as, um, again, once we saved up some more money, I'm trying to think, what did we do? Uh, we installed a pool because <laughs> this sounds mad, but we, this was in the year where California was having the massive forest fires. So, right, was, right. I remember that it was 2017. So it was extremely hot working in these fields, like. And sometimes in the greenhouses, you would just see everyone in their underwear and like in a bra or everything just because it was it was just that hot. It might have been 50, 60 degrees inside mm, these greenhouses. Wow. So our bosses were really nice and they installed an outdoor pool for us, which we filled up from the nearby river. And again, I have a video of this. I called it like Casa de Farm, like the resort on the farm. Oh, God. Send that in, send that in. Send it <laughs> Where in. just all of us chilling out with like beer in the middle of this pool, smoking weed. And you can just see, but in the distance, you can see forests on fire. That's the only. Oh, my gosh. It was, it was two worlds apart. And because the, I don't know if you were there, but I to put this to put the context of how intense these forest fires were there was one morning where the spanish girl thought it was snowing because there was like bits of white everywhere around our tents okay okay oh wow and it was ash coming from forest fires like a hundred kilometers away right and obviously we're all getting worried at this stage thinking is it going to make it going to make it to us because that was a that was an absolute possibility and then our and then our owners were getting ready with, with giant barrels of water in case of defense of these forest fires. But it turns out that wasn't the thing we needed to worry about. What we did need to worry about was the police. Because mm. the, following, the following week, we started noticing choppers going around. Oh my God. And so what we had to do when helicopters were going overhead was we would all have to hide under trees and our bosses would put uh, planks of wood over the the license plates of all the cars to make sure that nothing could be seen or nothing oh, could be tracked. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my God. You got more than you bargained for when you went on this trip to California. Oh, it was an adventure and a half. <laughs> it really was. Let me ask you a question that's been on my mind. I'll uh, Let me pause your story for just a second because I wanted to ask this before I forget, but had you not gone on this trip of a lifetime, like, I mean, would there have been another path that you would have taken? What if you would have stayed, you know, continued your studies or stayed, um, got work and you know, like, would, would you have done anything different had you not gone on this, on this trip? That is a very good, but difficult question. So I actually yeah actually i don't i think i would still be in ireland so i actually live in australia now and had i not done that year of travel so i'll tell you this you obviously you've done your year of travel when i came when i came back i felt like a foreigner in my own country i felt like nothing had changed and it was almost hard for me to connect with people so then my i was only, i when i came back i stayed in ireland for a month and i said i'm off i'm going to australia I'm going to stay there for good. And I had, I had no qualms about it because I just felt like a foreigner back home. And every Irish person I've met in Australia said they've gone through a very similar experience. Definitely, definitely. I actually equate your experience to similar to trying a new cuisine where you'll taste this cuisine in your home country 
and then you'll travel to the motherland of this cuisine and you'll be tasting it and like, oh my God, and your taste buds will like explode and all these experiences you'll feel and feelings. And then you'll go back home and you'll go back to that same cuisine you tried at home in your home version. <laughs> and it's just totally, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be like, this is bland. This doesn't taste the same. And it's like this disappointment, you know, like it, it's the same type of thing. When you travel, you're going to get like naysayers telling you, don't go to that place. Uh, they do this or, or they're going to do this to you and all this type of thing. And then when you go there, you meet some of the most friendliest people you've ever met. You have a wonderful experience. And then all that naysaying makes you kind of bitter and angry inside because you think, my goodness, here are people that have never been to these places and they're telling me about what I can expect to experience. And here it is, I've experienced something totally different. I can't tell you how many times that has happened to me. That's very true. And it got mm -hmm. gets to the point where if people, especially people who have never traveled to the places that I've been to, if they tell me anything negative, I'll do my research, I'll keep it in mind, and I'll take it with a grain of salt, and then I'll make my own uh, judgment and opinion after I've experienced it. Now, of course, you know, there are, you know, some places that are just definitely, you know, obviously dangerous, but I mean, honestly, the best thing is to experience it, and that's the experience you're feeling, and I know that feeling very well. I know it very well. Yeah, I agree, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world and actually, even even now, I find this so interesting. Now that I am in, let's say, a, a, a proper job, like a nine to five office job, everyone wants to know about your travel stories. And they want to, and they always ask, what did you learn about yourself? They never, and it's almost like a good sign for, I would say, managers, because they want to hear not so much about the mad parties you went on or anything like this, but they said, what did you learn or find out about yourself on these travels? Because it shows, it shows growth and a willingness to learn and try new things, whereas someone who doesn't travel may not have that in them. Absolutely, absolutely. And you'll inspire others to travel as well. And that's one of the main reasons I started this show, because I wanted people to experience all of the ups and downs of travel, especially the misadventures. and. Um, that it just gives them a lot more of an excitement, you know, and also mm. teaches them. And as I said, that's the essence of why, why I started this show is because I wanted to inspire, educate, and this is exactly what, uh, you're doing through your experiences, interacting with others, uh, not just here, but in your daily life. And, People say, I want to experience that too. And they'll learn from you. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And of course, the best stories that I've ever heard was when I was traveling and or from people who have traveled. And I'm talking about travel stories, by the way. The best ones that I've heard were from those sources. But anyway, I digressed a little, but what I really want to know is what happened on this trip? Like, what is the conclusion? And I'm sure everybody wants to know who's listening, what happened, like when you left and what's the conclusion? So when I was leaving the farm, as you can imagine, we're getting everything ready, getting uh, all my bits and bobs and cl cleaning all my clothes in vinegar, because it's the only way you can get rid of that weed smell. <laughs> Right. Oh, boy. And I was petrified going to the airport because I'm thinking I'm going to be stinking like weed. They're, they're going to pull me aside. Are they going to search me? I'm not too sure. Mm, so I get all yep. my clothes. Obviously, going to the airport, I'm on the train. I'm still a bit nervous, thinking I'm going to get searched. And then this black woman taps me on the shoulder. I turn around and she said, honey, you smell like some good weed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh oh so now people can smell me, it so I mean? whatever you did to wash it didn't work 
Oh, oh my god. So she asked me if I had oh. any, but I didn't have any to give. It's like, what's that cologne you're wearing? Oh, it's weed cologne. <laughs> Fresh from the fields. But it just it just heightened my anxiety thinking I'm definitely gonna be searched. <laughs> yeah. That's what so I'm I go thinking. to the airport. Everything is fine. No one questions me. No one searches me. And I'm I'm so re- as soon as the plane actually takes off. I'm so relieved because it's a direct flight to Dublin. So I know nothing's going to happen. I'm fine. <laughs> Why do I have a feeling something's going to happen? Go on. <laughs> Here it comes. And then when I land in Dublin, I go through security and I meet my mom and she's so excited. She hasn't seen her son in over a year. But as soon as she gives me a hug, she, it's, she almost coughs and she says, you really smell like weed. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> As I open oh, up my boy. jumper to just like take it off, um, I can see bits of leave, leaves in oh, my jumper. No. Oh and it, no. And weeks later, we're still washing my clothes and I'm finding weed in my socks. <laughs> oh my God. You were worried all this time about the smell and here you had remnants of it. Oh, you are so lucky they didn't catch you. And how I got, yeah, I know. How did I get through security? Oh my God. How with, they didn't discover weed it, I will never on know. me essentially oh my gosh you are one lucky dude (laughs) yeah that was the that was the end of my life on a weed farm you're sure now you're sure nothing else happened to you (laughs) you're sure (laughs) you sure well john i want to thank you so much i mean for sharing this story with us we hope you'll come back again because i'm sure someone like you (laughs) who loves adventure misadventure will have more stories to share with us thank you so much and take care of yourself and we'll be in touch thank you for having me Len and with that I want to thank John once again for coming on our program and I want to thank all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode And until then, good night or good day, but definitely God bless. Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. And don't forget to click that bell icon to be notified when more videos will be uploaded to the channel. Also, please consider browsing around the channel to check out my other videos that were posted previously. In the meantime, I wish you all a wonderful and a blessed day. Please take care, stay safe, and talk to you all again soon.